That picture was, uh, I was surfing, I was doing a project in Hawaii, and I had to <laughs> blend in with uh, <coughs> literally the native Hawaiians on our, on our project there. I needed a lot of public approval, so uh, I learned to surf later in life, and uh, <coughs> had long hair for a couple of years, but uh, <coughs> anyway, today I um, really want to talk to you a little bit about my life. Everybody here's got a good story, <coughs> but um, I want to point out a couple of things in my story. So some of you are followers of Jesus. There's something in this story for you. Some of you maybe got invited by a friend, and you know, maybe you went to church as a young man and maybe slipped away. Maybe you've never been church. I was, grew up unchurched. And so um, I'll point out along, along the journey a couple of different aspects for both those that are followers of Christ and those that might be thinking about that. And so my story started out with, uh, with a mom, a single mom, and I was a product of an affair. Uh, my mom was a gorgeous lady, sort of Marilyn Monroe, beautiful. Um, she grew up on a farm. My grandparents came over from Europe and uh, they were tenant farmers, <clears throat> got to keep 10% of what they raised and had nine kids. And my mom wanted to get off the farm as quick as she possibly could. And uh, so she slipped out when she was about 13, went to be a housekeeper for a doctor and his wife. And um, they had promised to uh, set her up with college if she would serve them uh, from 13 to 18. Uh, she wanted, mom wanted to be a nurse. and so. Sadly, at 18, the, the doctor got cancer, passed away, and that obligation to my mom was sort of forgotten. So she migrated uh, from a small town of western Pennsylvania to uh, the big metropolis of Pittsburgh, uh, which always amazing me, the uh, correlation between uh, Pittsburgh and Birmingham, the hills and the, the steel industry and everything. But um, she found herself as a hostess, beautiful gal, met my dad, who uh, had another family in a town not too far outside of Pittsburgh. And so they had an affair. <clears throat> and uh, my dad was uh, one of the richest men in the US for several decades. And so he uh, was easy to impress this little farm girl. You know, he took her to New York, the Plaza Hotel, Broadway shows, off to uh, Las Vegas, and bought her a new Cadillac, you know, just blowing the mind of this young girl. and. Um, uh, as you can imagine, uh, not too long after that, I was born. And so um, uh, I came along, and, and he hung around and kept sort of promising that um, he would get a divorce from this other family, come over uh, and uh, be my dad and rescue my mom and I, and we'd live happily ever after. Well, I was about six, and that happily ever after part sort of disappeared. And um, he disappeared. So uh, traumatic uh, for my mom and uh, very impactful. She, you know, felt betrayed and, and brokenhearted and uh, ended up uh, starting to drink and very quickly uh, got into uh, drugs. <clears throat> and so I grew up in a, a tiny apartment rough part of town in Pittsburgh, and you know my early babysitters were strippers and drug addicts, and just it's God's hand that I'm standing here before you today. And so um, that's really how I got into the real estate business. Um, being a little guy, six, seven years old, the, uh, the landlord would come looking for the rent, and when you're a little kid, you know, you know, can't process things like drug abuse and that with, with adults, and so, my defense mechanism was that, um, you know, my mom's sick. That's what I would tell people. My mom's sick today. And so the landlord would take me under his wing, and uh, he'd have me tag along, and I'd slop some paint on some stuff or try to trim grass, and, and I was probably making more of a mess than fixing anything. And, but he would pay me, and then I would pay the rent. And that's how we went for a few years. But an amazing thing happened. Um, as I got to eight, nine years old, he started uh, really teaching me about real estate. So he would buy these old Victorian homes in Pittsburgh, where, right in the neighborhood where we were, and um, he would break them up from single-family homes into multi-family homes. So there'd be a one-room apartment, two-room apartment, and so he would say, hey, 
you know, your mom and, and you, you guys are paying $150 a month, and Mr. Jones over here, he's paying 200 because he's got a little nicer place, and Mrs. Smith has a fireplace, and over here, she paid 350 You know, and he'd explain this and do the math, and, and so as a little kid, I was learning real estate, and I think it stuck with me. And so <clears throat> as life goes on, then um, my mom kind of hovered in that same zone for many years, and uh, I was a so-so student, um, messed around prob probably more than I should, and ended up <clears throat> uh, the, going in the military. Um, when I went in, you could get as much college education as you want. The military would pay for it. Now, long you get your PhD if you wanted, and then it also had lots of programs where I could take care of my mom. So I thought that would be a pretty good deal. And uh, that landlord that I, I worked with for a couple years, he had actually taught me how to shoot because in the basement of this house, this old Victorian house we lived in, in the basement was full of rats. And so he, he bought me a little pellet gun and uh, it was a creepy, remember that Home Alone movie when Macaulay Cockey goes in the downstairs and it's kind of creepy furnace, that's kind of what it was like. It was dark and there's one dingy little light hanging there that didn't work half the time. And so he said, hey, every rat that you shoot, I'll give you a dollar. Well, they, that's fantastic. So. I was down there, and I'd try to turn on the light when the rats, you could hear their little claws on the concrete, and it never worked. There was too big of a gap from the light, and so I rigged a little flashlight on this pellet gun, taped it up. Uh, I considered myself one of the original Navy SEAL, so I would sit there. A little rat would scoot around. I'd flip that light on. He'd freeze for a second. I'd kill him. So there are some days I made 15 bucks killing rats. So. But, so I fancied myself a shooter, and uh, so I said, well, I'll go in the military and, and maybe be a, be a sniper, be an infantry, and join the Army, and uh, God had his hand on me. I didn't know God at the time. I had uh, been to church maybe three or four times from zero to uh, 17 when I went in the military. And um, so uh, a funny thing happened. I went to the recruiting office. Told him I wanted to be a sniper, and uh, I said, oh, that's great. Come back, take some tests. And, and uh, at the time, I had lots of friends going in, and they, they'd go down the recruiting office and walk out, signed, and knew where they were going. And I'm going back week after week, taking tests. And these guys, my friends are starting to make fun of me, like, you're too dumb to get in the Army. <laughs> it's really bad. You know? <laughs> but uh, God had a different idea, and uh, they were testing me and uh, whatever they were doing. But uh, at the end, they said, hey, we've got an idea for you. Instead of being a, a sniper, how would you like to be in counterintelligence? I didn't really know what that was at the time. And I said, what does that mean? And they said, well, you'd be a spy. And uh, I said, well, that sounds kind of interesting. You know, uh, James Bond, I, threw, I go, yeah, yeah. And I said, well, do we get all that cool stuff that James Bond has? Said, Not really, it's the Army. Uh, but they said that we guarantee it'll be better than, uh, than being in the infantry, being a sniper. So I trusted them and uh, had, a, had a great time. So I go through basic training, and then I show up at uh, spy school. And it's this huge complex in the southern Arizona desert, <clears throat> and uh, it's a place where um, there's FBI and CIA and, and Navy. Everybody's there across training, and it's the very first day. And uh, now in the military, <clears throat> if you're not familiar with it, so if you get awarded uh, something like this to go to spy school, um, you, you have to perform and you have to get, get through that school. And if you don't, then you get re shot back and you're back in infantry. So um, it's pretty important. Uh, and now I'm understanding, now that I've been in for a couple months, just what a valuable opportunity I have. But the first day I'm at spy school, uh, we go through the chow line and some guys see me looking as a newbie. And uh, they invite me to sit down with them. And... Um, I'd start eating my food, and the guy touches my arm and says, hey, we're going we're gonna to ask the Lord to bless this food before we eat. So I put down my utensils. That was new to me. I'd never experienced that. And uh, he said a prayer and then looked at me. It was okay. Everybody started eating. As we go through lunch, he shares the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, that Jesus was a man, came incarnate, um, had this incredible life that we get to read about in the New Testament, and that uh, he was brutally crucified raised from the dead three days later, and that we can still communicate with him today through prayer and through the Holy Spirit. Sounded interesting, but um, 
he, he then asked me, would you like to bow your head and pray to receive Jesus Christ? So I kind of looked around the table at these other warriors, uh, who seasoned military men, and they were all staring at me, and I didn't really know what the right answer was, <clears throat> so I chickened out, and I said, no, I'm not sure that's for me. And so went through military, had a great time in the military, got out a few years later, and um, <clears throat> found myself, I, I um, would take care of my mom, and go into school, using my veterans' benefits to, uh, to go to Colorado. <clears throat> and um, a colonel that I served with had gotten out about the same time, and he bought a little real estate company. And uh, he said, hey, why don't you get your salesman's license, and you can join this firm, and uh, you know, you'll make lots and lots of money in real estate. So sounds good to me. Uh, help pay the bills while I'm going to school, take care of my mom. And, uh, <clears throat> but it was terrible when you're... I was 21, 22 years old. Nobody wanted to buy a house from me because I really didn't know what I was doing. So failed miserably at that. And I was about to give that up. And I told the colonel, I'm going to got this great bartending job. And I'm going to get out of this real estate, focus on school, and uh, yeah, find something else to do. And he challenged me and said, hey, <clears throat> um, you're a knucklehead. You're not using the resources that we trained you in the military improvise and adapt, and that uh, if you would use your better benefits to buy a property, you're a terrible salesman, why don't you try to be an investor? So I said, how can I be an investor? I'm broke. And he said, you got to use your resources. So the only resource I really had at the time was this veterans GI Bill, as they call it, to be able to buy a property for essentially no money down. So he kind of held my hand on the first one and bought a little four-unit apartment building not far from the military base and um, fixed it up, came back to the colonel and said, what should I do now? He said, I assume you're still broke. I said, yes, sir, I am. And he said, why don't you uh, go ahead and sell that? So we did. And within 100 days, I made about $37,500. It was all the money in the world to me at the time. And uh, I was just jumping for joy. I actually didn't cash the check for a few days, and I took it uh, to my business professor at the University of Colorado, showed it to him, and he couldn't believe it. It was uh, uh, almost as uh, much, as about half as much as he was making as a full tenured uh, professor at the business school. And uh, he said, what are you going to do next? I said, I don't know. He said, I do. You're going to keep doing that. That's a successful model. So I ended up doing that about 80 more times in the next two years. And um, just had a great time. But th these were generally crappy properties, tough parts of town, and uh, full of challenges. Uh, and it helped me learn the fundamentals of real estate. Um, and I wanted to learn more. So I was taking some uh, education classes and um, also lots of events like this that were sort of networking, non-Christian events to network. And so I... Uh, I went to this networking function, and there was a fellow there that was sort of the top developer in town. And uh, he had a beautiful wife. Um, I'd seen her around town, and he had cool, fast cars and a big, fancy house. And those were all the things that I wanted. And so I, uh, I got up the nerve, and I went to him, and, and I said, uh, Mr. Logan, here's my card. I'm new in real estate. I just did my first deal, um, and I'd really like to get mentored by you. Uh, would you... Would you mentor me? And uh, he reached in his pocket, he pulled out a card. He said, yeah, here's my card. Come to my office on Monday morning, seven o'clock, and uh, I'll mentor you. I said, wow, that card was like a lottery ticket. And uh, so I show up at his office the following Monday and uh, go in the boardroom, big fancy boardroom. There's eight or nine guys sitting around the table. He's at the head. And in front of each guy, there was this thick book. Some were black leather, some were red leather. And uh, it happened to be a Bible study. And I thought, man, uh, I hadn't been to church, didn't know the stories, didn't own a Bible. Um, kind of felt like I got hoodwinked into this. But these guys, these men just loved on me, took me under their wing, even though I knew nothing, bought me a Bible, slowly worked with me to take me through the different books, explain the major concepts. And um, it, it really began to pour into my life and to mentor me took me on this incredible journey. Several months into every month, they would take me to an event like this, and there'd be a speaker who would uh, share his story, share the gospel, make an invitation to pray to receive Christ at the end of the program. 
And um, they would always get the table right up front, like table three right here, and uh, hoping closeness to the speaker would impact my life. But um, what happened, you know, I was, uh, had a, a girlfriend, um, was sleeping with her, smoking, drinking, had a lot of ex-Special uh, Forces bad habits that followed me into my early business career. And um, it just wasn't taking. And so, um, and, and I would actually lie to these wonderful men that were mentoring me and uh, pretend I was somewhat academic and uh, I was struggling with the theory of evolution, uh, which I'm sure they knew was a bunch of baloney. And so six or seven months into this journey, uh, there was a speaker and uh, he was literally a rocket scientist. He helped put man on the moon and after he did that, checked the box, he went around the world telling people about Jesus Christ. And so that day, um, he spoke about evolution. He debunked it in a way that was, we all could understand. And I found myself sitting at this front table just crying like a baby, prayed to receive Christ right then. And, and uh, it was a big moment for me. And um, it, it wasn't such a shock that, um, you know, slowly started to rethink my life. Actually went to my girlfriend, she's my wife now, and said, hey, um, uh, I think that we should maybe move apart and be celibate before we get married. And uh, she thought I'd lost my mind. She, she like, her immediate reaction was, who's the girl? She thought I was breaking up with her. And uh, um, I said, no, but remember I told you I went to this luncheon thing and I prayed to receive Christ and uh, I just feel like we're doing the wrong thing. And so there were these slow changes in my way of thinking. And um, so we moved apart, uh, committed ourselves to each other, and we got married several years later. And um, coming up on 38 years in a week and a half. So, um, so that was sort of the early, early part of life. As uh, going forward then, I, I wanted to migrate from being a slumlord to being a developer. And um, so I started working on a little bit bigger projects and one project led to another. And all of a sudden, um, my wife and I found ourselves making an awful lot of money. <clears throat> there were many years, $5 million, big year of $10 million. And, um, and it led to, and we're baby Christians at the time. <clears throat> I, I look back on it and I say I'm, I'm, I was a nominal Christian. And so, um, you know, more stuff, bigger house, better vacations, more cars, that sort of thing. And uh, a few years into it, <clears throat> there was a real estate correction. And uh, my wife and I found ourselves in a, uh, in a terrible predicament where we're personal guarantors on a $106 million loan on a massive shopping center that we had developed. And the market had corrected, and that shopping center uh, went from being worth $150 million to about $40 million seemingly overnight. And, uh, but we still owed $106 million. And so <clears throat> we, my wife and I met with our, our accountant and lawyer and uh, to try to find a plan and the plan that they suggested was, hey, you guys are, are young and uh, got a lot of life in front of you. <clears throat> we think that you should just file bankruptcy and flesh out that $106 million and um, start over. And uh, there's nothing wrong with filing bankruptcy, but <laughs> we, we decided we better pray about that. That sounds like a big thing. So my wife and I went home and prayed about it, which was kind of abnormal. We, we prayed a little bit together, but not a lot. And uh, we held hands and, and prayed, and we really asked the Lord to, to speak into that. And uh, we did that for a few days. And, yeah, we've clearly heard the Lord tell us in that particular situation, um, no, if you walk with me, I'll show you how to pay that off, and um, you won't have to file bankruptcy. So we decided to go on that journey. And um, it was really the first time I recall really hearing from the Lord and really sort of me stepping into that through faith. Now, it took five years to pay that $106 million off, 
we don't have time to tell you all the cool God stories and how we did it, but there were many, many weeks during that when we didn't know if we were going to have enough money to pay the mortgage or groceries. We had two little girls at the time, <clears throat> and it was, it was a very tough five years. But we popped out on the other side of it, got everybody paid off, and, um, and we looked at each other in amazement, like God walked us through that horrible valley, <clears throat> and, we, and we made it. Now, we made it out with no assets, and you know, we managed to kind of keep our house. Uh, we had sold off the fancy cars and bought 10-year-old cars, and it really had a downshift in lifestyle. Um, <clears throat> but um, we then began to seek, what would the Lord have for us next? And um, <clears throat> so my wife said, as we do that, can I ask you to not guarantee loans, not that we had any net worth to guarantee a loan, but she said, I would really like you to not be in the guarantee, loan guarantee business because I really don't want to experience that kind of five years again. And so I went to my prayer desk and I began to pray and ask the Father, Lord, what, what do you want me to do? And in a nanosecond, he gave me a download of a business plan. And that business plan was essentially to go to Wall Street and uh, get a bunch of money and start this real estate business, open offices from Los Angeles to Washington, D.C., Tampa and Miami, <clears throat> 11 different offices, and find in those markets a younger developer and basically bankroll that developer. And we would build apartments and shopping centers and industrial buildings <clears throat> and, and create this interesting, amazing platform. That's the essence of the plan. Uh, but we had no assets to start with, just an idea. And so um, by this time, I had dropped out of school, out of college, hadn't finished, had never been to New York, had no Wall Street connections, and I literally fly to New York City on a Sunday afternoon and, and look up all the major banks, you know all their names, and uh, just on Monday started cold calling, calling banks, see if I get an appointment, and pitch this business idea. And uh, amazingly, on Friday as I'm headed back home, I call my wife from the airport, and uh, she says, how, how did it end up? I said, you're not going to believe it. Um, they're going to give me $500 million for this idea. And the point of the story there, guys, is that as you consider to walk with the Father and you seek to hear from him and he speaks and you obey, you enter into what I call the supernatural. Cool supernatural stuff happens. And so <clears throat> that's what was happening in this instance. And so because I had heard, because I had obeyed, gone to a foreign place, Wall Street, foreign to me, no pedigree to really fit into that mold, <clears throat> um, the Lord honored that. Underlying that, guys, if, if the Father calls you into something, he will resource you into that thing, whether it's a ministry thing or a business thing, could be a relationship thing. And so that's, um, that started to happen in my life more and more frequently. And so it started to look a little bit different. Instead of me saying, hey, I'm going to go build this shopping center over here, um, I would begin to ask the Father, and, and then ask the Father to bless that. I would begin to ask the Father, I'd flip the script. And I'd begin to say, Father, what deals do you want me to do? And an amazing thing happened. He started bringing in transactions and bringing in deals. <clears throat> and then you continue to press into him to get direction on those deals. We call that progressive revelation as he takes you on that journey step by step. And so <clears throat> going through my life then a little further, I had a chance to uh, um, meet, uh, remember at the beginning of this story, I mentioned my dad had another family uh, a few miles outside of town. And um, my dad had, uh, had bought that son uh, a football team and a hockey team, and um, uh, the San Francisco 49ers and the Pittsburgh Penguins. And so <clears throat> my, at this point in my life, uh, my father had passed away, my mom had passed away, and uh, I felt like I needed to find some closure with this brother. And so I sent him a letter, um, and we ended up meeting. He didn't know that he had a brother. I had known about him my whole life. My mom had always talked to me about um, the DeBartolo family and that, you know, whatever happens, 
uh, I should love them and honor them and protect their name, which I always thought was awkward, given what her circumstances were from the Barlow Sr., my father that had abandoned us. But out of uh, obedience and honoring my mom, I, I'd always had that kind of mentality. And so <clears throat> I ended up meeting my brother um, later in life, and uh, we hit it off well. And after a couple of years of just getting our families together, we started this thing called DeBartolo Development, and you know we've got billions of dollars of, of real estate across the country that, uh, that we develop and sell um, coast to coast. And so we've had a lot of fun. So even when the Father calls us, even in relational things like that, reaching out to a, a, a brother that we didn't know our entire adult life, the Father can put together and heal broken families like that. And so <clears throat> if you begin to think about it, if uh, Rob from YBL could get here on the stage, Warren Buffett or Bill Gates, we'd all come and we'd listen and we'd take notes, right? It'd be fantastic to be up close and personal with those guys. But really what we have to offer is something greater than that. You know, we have our Heavenly Father that we can touch base with 24-7 every day. And he freely gives us, as he says in his word, wisdom, discernment, the things that we need to navigate marriage, parenting, business. In fact, um, if you look, there's a cool verse in uh, John, John 16, 13, where <clears throat> Jesus is speaking and he says, I'm leaving you the Holy Spirit and that Holy Spirit will guide you into all truth. Now, all truth isn't, you know, all truth being mysteries of the Catholic Church or whatever denomination you happen to be interested in or a part of. It's all truth about your life. And this sounds a little weird, but it's almost, it's about you. It's about um, what the Father wants to do in and through you. And so as we, um, and, and the way we access that is through praying to receive Christ. When we do that, when we bow our heads, pray to receive Christ, we're immediately set with the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. So then we're connected to his spirit supernaturally. And we begin, if we're intentional and willing, so I could have met you in the parking lot, prayed with you to receive Christ, you come in here, you can begin to hear from the Father. There's no additional requirements needed. You don't have to have a doctorate in theology or anything like that. It's that simple. It's for everyday knuckleheads like me. And so um, I'll, I'll give you an application from hearing from God. So that verse 16, 13 goes on, and it says, besides all things, Jesus says, that Holy Spirit will tell you of things to come. Now, if you're a business person, there's a business meeting today, I want to know things to come, right? Um, right now, the economy feels very wobbly, right? Um, inflation fears. You know, we're, we're in the real estate business. For us, a typical apartment building, our lumber cost just went up $3.8 million on the typical 300-unit apartment building. So we want to know things to come in our business, right? And so I'll give an example of how that works in a business setting. So in spring of 2007, while I'm abiding, so what abiding means is I'm having a daily quiet time with the Lord. I've got a journal. I'm writing my questions to him. I'm praying. I got a Bible. And I'll have an iPad because I've got an app that I use called the Blue Letter Bible app to kind of quickly navigate through the Bible and to cross-reference and look up some words. And so in that quiet time in 2007 where I'm abiding, I hear from the Lord there's going to be a real estate correction. Well, I'm a real estate guy. That's pretty important. So I write that down, and uh, I go to work later that day, and I get my executive staff and say, hey, the Lord said... Now, we don't have a Christian company. Not everybody there is a believer by any stretch. In fact, it's a distinct minority, um, and, uh, which freaks them out when I say, hey, the Lord said. That, can, that scares some people. Um, and so uh, sometimes they call me the bishop, so this is a nickname. And so we, uh, I said, hey, uh, the Lord said there's going to be a correction. What do you guys think? And we're a very research-driven firm, and they start pulling out the research no, 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 nobody sees that, nobody thinks that, you're crazy. 
And so God's so good to us, and he knows that we have teeny-weeny faith, right? And so there's an idea called progressive revelation, where if we take a baby step in faith, he'll begin to give us progressive revelation and show us the journey he wants us to go on. So <clears throat> the next day, so I took that baby step by engaging my senior staff with this idea of a correction. The next day, the father shows us, we're trying to buy a property in front of the Orlando airport to build a Target anchored shopping center. We're gonna pay $4 a foot for the land and I call the seller and he says, oh my gosh, I changed my mind. I'm gonna sell it to a guy that's gonna pay me $15 a foot. Now just because that happens, Target doesn't pay more rent. Uh, so what we began to see in that, the progressive revelation was that there's too much money in the system. That's what I saw. Not all my staff caught that on that first one. A couple did. But then during the next week, that happened five more times. Now everybody in my company says, wow, there's too much money in the system. This is going to end badly. So as a CEO, I've got to decide. We call it a crisis of belief. I have to decide, am I going to follow the research or am I going to follow, follow my heavenly father? So I want to follow my heavenly father because I know he's going to lead me in all truth because that's what his word says. And he's going to show me a things to come. And so we had just under a billion dollars of development going on and we began to push to finish those projects and to get them sold. And you know what happened in October of 08, the market crashed, real estate market across the country and prices, you know, and values of real estate dropped 50%, 70, 80%. And so we were well equipped we had hordes of cash, and we survived. Not only did we survive, we thrived. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll tell you that story in a second. But now we had another dilemma. So we've got a bunch of folks that make several hundred thousand dollars each a year, very high caliber team. And uh, the board then is saying, hey, now all the news has turned negative, right? Now Wall Street Journal, CNBC, everything is out there. There's not going to be another apartment building built for years. There's not going to be this built for now, forever. And now the news is very, very negative. And so my board's reading that saying, hey, all these expensive people you have, why don't you get rid of them and let's drop our overhead? Not an, un not an unusual request. But the question we ask as followers of Jesus is, Father, what do you have to say about that? Father, what do you have to say about that? So I went to the father and, and he said, no, don't want you to do that. So now I'm in a conflict with the board a little bit. So that conflict continued. And in June of 09, the father told me very clearly, start buying. Start buying real estate. And we did. We started buying. And uh, we bought $5 billion worth of real estate really cheap. 24,000 apartments, dozens of hotels, shopping centers, you name it. Uh, banks were giving them to us for nothing. <clears throat> and we created an enormous amount of wealth. We sold all that once the markets came back. We made a ton of money. And, and again, I don't want you to get the impression that this is some sort of prosperity theology. It's not that at all. It's about walking with the Father in personal relationships, in marriage, in parenting, and in business, since we're in a bit of a business meeting here today. I share that business story. And so... <clears throat> As we begin to follow him, he begins to open doors and to change dynamics. If you think about this, in Genesis, the first book of the Bible, God himself speaks, right? He creates the heaven, he creates the earth, he creates water. So his spirit transcends the physical. It takes a while to wrap your brain around that. But as we step in and we're listening to the Holy Spirit, it begins to move and transcends the physical. And amazing things, the cool supernatural stuff of the Bible begins to happen in our lives when we abide, when we begin to hear from the Father, have the bravery and the courage to step into what he's asking us to do. And uh, it applies to all area of life. You know, two years ago, um, I was on a vacation with my wife and some other couples who were in Europe, and all of a sudden, boom, I don't feel good. And I call my doctor and he says, you've got bladder cancer over the phone. He said, now I know you're with your Christian friends and the reason I tell you that is start praying with them and I'll get everything lined up 
for cancer treatment as soon as you land. Okay, so that was a new journey uh, for me. And so I get home, go to the Cleveland Clinic, um, they go inside, wow, bladder, stage four, tumor, doesn't look good. We're gonna give you chemo for 12 weeks and um, we are then gonna take your bladder out and get everybody you know praying. Hopefully, you got about a 35% chance to survive. Hopefully, you'll make it. Okay, so we got our prayer network going and uh, start praying. And God just navigated that supernaturally. So nine weeks into chemo, uh, heavy doses of chemo to try to arrest the cancer. My body started shutting down and failing in the hospital a bunch of times. And um, come out, the docs say, no more chemo. You can't take it. So um, they said, we're going to take your bladder out in two weeks and try to save your life. <clears throat> My wife uh, went to a chiropractor. And he was telling her about a, a doctor not far from our neighborhood that is a holistic medical doctor that treats cancer. So we went to see him, and God began lining up supernaturally these different treatments. So I started going to this doctor, <clears throat> and a very unusual set of treatments, and I'm there every day for eight hours a day. It ended up being for eight months. Had to change my diet. Um, in the middle of that, our, our housekeeper is Brazilian, and she said, um, in Brazil, anybody that gets cancer, we have them eat this plant called a graviola. It looks like a spiky watermelon. And it's kind of hard to find in the US. But we found a company that manufactures it and puts it in a capsule. So I started eating graviola. And then our, uh, another doctor friend of ours said, hey, I've just finished doing a, a paper on peptides. And if you take a shot of peptide in your belly every day, It'll create uh, cells that'll go eat and kill that cancer. So God's lining up all these incredible, crazy, weird things from a housekeeper to doctors to prayer. <clears throat> and after eight months, you know, this tumor literally passes out my body and they do scans and cancer free. So cancer clinic at Cleveland still can't explain it. And uh, it just one of those cool miracles, those cool God stories. So. Um, that's a little bit about what my journey looks like and what your journey could look like. I'm not special. This is available to everybody. And so uh, if you're a follower of Jesus, this is readily available to you. You're indwelt with the Holy Spirit. If you're not, guys, I really would encourage you to consider praying to receive Christ and going on this journey. Uh, because I think... As a Christian businessman, you're going to want to know what's to come, right? Economy's a little wonky right now, right? I want to know what's to come. I want to, I want to know what's behind that curtain, right, for my business. I want to know how to raise my children. I've got adult children, some special needs, and it's super complex. I want to know how to navigate that. Um, we're, re we're empty nesters. I want to learn how to navigate that successfully with my wife. Um, we've got a, a nationwide ministry teaching this concept of abiding, how to hear from God. You know, I want to know that. So there's lots of things I want to know. I'm sure there's lots of things you want to know. And so with that, um, I would really encourage you to, to think about abiding. In fact, Rob's going to send around to you a little link, and uh, we've got a 45-minute video that you can download for free and kind of see one of our teachings on abiding and, and what that looks like. But um, love for you to uh, consider that. Uh, to ch it's a dynamic that will absolutely change your life. And uh, with that, Rob, uh, you want to come up and, and close us out? Thanks very much.